Hello and welcome to another whiteboard training video. I'm Isaiah Hankel with Cheeky Scientist. Today we're talking about R&D jobs. R&D stands for Research and Development. That might be the obvious part. What's not so obvious is that if you have done research in academia, and if you have a PhD, you have, you've done research, it's a key transferable skill, you have the R in R&D. What you likely don't have is the D in R&D, development. You may not even understand fully what development means in terms of industry. What it, do, what it means, and I'll give you this example, think of a, a lab that uses an antibody. Okay, you use that antibody to do research, to do experiments, to get data. Okay, that's the R. However, you don't make that antibody. That's part of development. Development's a spectrum. It could go all the way into what's called commercialization in industry. Now, maybe you are in a lab that makes your own antibody. That's great. So you do develop it, develop it in that sense. Uh, you use it for more research. That's on the spectrum of development. But do you go as far as to package it, right? That's part of the development process. Do you go as far as to distribute it? Okay, that's part of the development process too. Do you sell it to other labs, other companies? That's what they do in industry. That's the development part that you likely don't have experience with. You will be tested on this when you're interviewing for R&D jobs. Too many PhDs think that, oh, I do research already in academia. Getting a research job in industry is easy. It's not because it's not just research, it's R&D. And they're going to ask you a lot of questions, questions that you can handle if you prepare for them, if you have training, especially if you have access to a network of R&D professionals who can help you, who can set up informational interviews with you, who can do mock interviews with you. That's a big part of what we do in our, our R&D society. It's one of our first advanced programs at Cheeky Scientist, the R&D Society. I'm going to tell you more about it at the end. But first, I want you to think of another R, the R of rationale. They're going to be testing you on your rationale. Why do you want a job at this company? Why do you want to work for this company versus another company? Why do you want to be a scientist in the first place? As someone who wants to get into an R&D job, whether you're a scientist or an engineer, uh, a researcher in general, you're going to have to answer those rationale-based questions. So let's talk about the seven most difficult questions you will be asked during an R&D interview. Number one. Why are you a good scientist or engineer? This goes into that rationale ideology, the rationale questioning. Why? Why are you good at what you do? Why should they hire you? That's what they're really asking. And that's a, a, another take on this question. So if you got asked that question, what would you say? A lot of people will try to do something that's similar to a humble brag. They'll try to say why they're good, but they're not perfect, and they'll try not to seem too arrogant or confident. This is the wrong approach, okay? Instead here, focus on your passion for research. Focus on why you love it, why it drives you, why it gives you an incredible work ethic, why you love going through information, why you love going through data, why you love solving problems, okay? That should be your rationale. And then get technical, okay? Don't get too technical. Don't talk about the techniques that you can do because maybe it's a technique they don't want. Maybe it's an outdated technique because in industry they're using robotics for it. So don't focus on your amazing technical skills, but focus on why you love technical skills, why you love learning about new innovations that allow research to go further. Okay, that's the angle that you want to take on this question. Number two, what could you bring to another R&D team company? I love this question. This is an amazing flip on the question of what can you bring to this company. Instead, they're saying, what can you bring to another company? Or what would you bring to another company? Because it puts you in a different frame of mind. Instead of selling yourself for that position, they want to have you sell yourself for a different position, a different company. And it's a, it's a tough behavioral question because in your mind, you're going to be thinking, I don't want to act like I want to work for another company. So you're going to water down your talents, your skills. This is exactly what you should not do. Okay, instead, answer that question just like you would answer why you should work for this company. So if they say why you should work for another company, you want to sell why you are a competitive candidate, why other companies would want you. Because, again, going back to the first question, because of your passion for science, because of your work ethic, your drive, your love of solving problems, your, your key transferable skills of being able to learn quickly, process information quickly, your ability to collect information and data, research to, to find the most credible information, to, to innovate, uh, to, to analyze, right? These transferable skills, focus on those transferable skills, the ones you don't even realize are crucial. 
especially if you're talking to hiring managers, uh, recruiters, people in HR, who usually don't have PhDs, and they're the first gatekeepers. They love to ask this question. Number three, are you ethical? Your mind is going to see this question as what are your biggest weaknesses, right? In a sense, you're going to think it's a trick question. It's not a trick question. This is something you should immediately say, yes, I'm completely ethical. Nothing is above the ethics of the data. The data is what it is. The information is what it is. It's my job to be as objective as possible to find out what is right, what is correct, what's going to help us move forward so that we don't build experiment after experiment or project after project on something that's faulty because it will always come back. Truth will always out. You want to be very firm in this. Don't be wishy-washy. Don't act like you're, don't, you're trying to be humble with it by saying, I'm ethical, but I'm not perfect. No, you're 100% ethical. That's how you answer that question. Number four, how do you handle pressure? What a great question. How do you handle stress? What do you do? Again, this is going to make you go inside your own head. Don't sit there quietly because it's going to seem like you don't handle stress or pressure well at all. Like, I love that this is a question about pressure and stress that's testing how you handle pressure and stress <laughs> just by asking it. Basically, what you want to say is the truth. You want to say, I handle pressure by reprioritizing, okay? Whether or not you do this initially, I mean, when you get stressed, you don't want to say you, you, you go and exercise Right? You, you read a lot of this nonsense online. Oh, I go exercise or I do me uh, yoga meditation. What? That's great for a job at McDonald's, okay? Not for a high-level job at a Pfizer, an Intel, whatever. You want to tell them that you reprioritize. As stress and pressure builds up, you realize you can't do everything. So you sit back down and you go over your priorities and you readjust those priorities as necessary based on the timeline and budget that you have. Number five. Why do you want this job versus others? This is very similar to the previous question, number two, right? So why do you want this job versus others? So it's going to make you think that you're not supposed to sell yourself because they brought in others, right, competitors. You want to act like you're wanted by all of these other companies, which means you should talk about yourself and your accomplishments. What have you achieved? Okay, what are the tangible results, the quantified results that you can discuss? Whether or not they're pu you have publications, there's other things you can discuss. Collaborations, those can be quantified. Presentations, methodologies. So many PhDs forget to talk about the methodologies or protocols or even lesson plans that they've optimized. Those are called standard operating procedures or systems in business. They're very valuable to companies, especially in the R&D department, because they make things scalable. So talk about them. And there's many others. Number six, what if your experiment or project fails? Well, as a PhD, you should have plenty of experience with failure, so lean into that. Say, this is not the first time that I've had an experiment or project fail, or it wouldn't be the first time I've had an experiment or project fail. Uh, what I do in that case is I look at the negative data or the negative information or the failure, and I learn from it. And then I adjust course moving forward. And then tell them about a time where that happened and you were able to use that data or information to move towards another answer faster or to where you had a surprising result in the future based on that information because you responded to that feedback positively. Number seven, if I gave you X, this is especially true in R&D positions, they will interview, they'll ask you this type of question over and over again, but this is the, the formula of this question. If I gave you X and I wanted Y, what would you do? If I gave you this antibody and these cells and I wanted this result, what would you do? If I gave you this instrument and these robotics and I wanted this result, what would you do? If I gave you X and I wanted Y, what would you do? Don't approach this like an academic where you start theorizing and you're like, well, I'd have to go to the, I'd have to go to the papers and the research and figure this out. Yes, they know you're going to do research and you're going to rely on knowledge, but based on your current knowledge in terms of problem solving, what would you do? And this is why you have to understand the experiments they're doing at that company the technical things they're doing at that company, so you can talk about this somewhat intelligently. Now, if you get stuck, maybe they use a methodology you've never even heard of. Maybe it's somewhat proprietary and they didn't even mention it to you. It's, there's nothing online about it, but they bring it up in an interview. Don't panic. See it as a question that your thesis committee would ask where you'd have to say, I don't know. It's okay to say that. Say, I don't know exactly what to do in that situation, or I wouldn't know how to get to that result now, but 
I would talk to other people that have been at the company before. I would talk to other leaders in the R&D department or the other directors, the, the other scientists or the other engineers, depending on the position that you're going into. I would look to this literature based on what they said, and I would find out which experiments to set up, and then based on the data that I received, I would move towards X and move towards Y and move towards Z to the result that they wanted. Okay, So you don't have to have the answer. That's part of what they're testing you on. If you have any questions on this, let me know in the comments below. We are opening up enrollment this Monday, February 3rd to our R&D Society. It's one of our largest programs. It's one of our first, it's actually our very first advanced program, specifically for PhDs who want to get into R&D positions. Check it out. We'll be posting about it on this page, on others. If you want to find out more about it, go to society.cheekyscientist.com society.cheekyscientist.com. As always, remember your value as a PhD and start thinking and acting like a successful industry professional.